Anthony Boza and tonight's guest, author of the book Crash and Burn, available now on iBooks, Artie Lang. <laughs> What's up, guys? How you doing? Oh, I love you too, sweetie. Thank you. It's usually never a girl. It's usually a guy who yells that out. <laughs> That's all I have is cargo pants. Oh, thank, thank you for a, a woman yelling I love you instead of a plumber. <laughs> People said to me, uh, Art, did you uh, get laid a lot from being on the Howard Stern Show? And I said, if I was willing to have sex with guys who had their own bread route in Jersey City, I'd be like a young Warren Beatty. Uh, it's good to be here, and I'm glad you're here. I was getting drunk at the Genius Bar. That was <laughs> you know you're a drug addict when a Genius Bar is a trigger. Uh, this is Anthony Boza, my co-author. Hello. Author. Very happy to be here. Very happy you're here. Uh, all right. Well, this is uh, a part of the book. Uh, <laughs> after I uh, got into a fight with my assistant on the Howard Stern Show on the air, I thought it would be a good idea to go on a five-day bachelor party to Amsterdam. Uh, and uh, this is an excerpt from the book about that trip. This is from Crash and Burn. Things started out all right because I slept through most of the flight, but what really helped was that I was booked into a different hotel than the other guys. I had the cash to burn, so I would booked a suite in a five-star establishment a couple of miles away from them. The first night I crashed hard because I still had a lot to sleep off, but by 4 p.m. the next day, I was rested and ready to begin my version of a well-earned vacation. Isolation and getting high. I had no problem celebrating Jason's upcoming nuptials my way because in my mind, that was still honoring him. So I got into a cab and told the driver to find me some fun. He took, me one, uh, he took one look at me and made a beeline for the red light district where I bought a bunch of pills from some guy on the street who was wearing a beret. I remember wondering if that was Amsterdam code for dealer holding. As a rule, berets pissed me off on sight and I refused to talk to anybody wearing them. But this guy got a pass for life. He had, a, he had every opiate I'd ever heard of. So I bought a sack of pills, then went looking for a hooker, which is my chaser of choice for a double shot of opiates. I found myself a solid seven and negotiated a rate that would get her back to my hotel. This chick was a hooker through and through, which is uh, really what you want when hiring a prostitute. Any guy who kids himself that a woman for hire is his girlfriend, even while it's happening, is a complete idiot. The fucking business is a fucking business, so act accordingly and everyone will go home happy. This broad was amazing. Just completely a prostitute. There was no way anyone at the hotel... <laughs> Bellboy to the bartender to the desk clerk manning the graveyard shift was going to address her as Mrs. Lang. <laughs> and she was so accommodating, as high as I was at the time, I will never forget how understanding she was that I hadn't changed my American dollars into euros. She and I spent the rest of the night talking while crushing and snorting every flavor we could find in the bag of pills I'd scored. She spoke decent English, and we only had sex once, because like drug addicts will do, the time we spent together was all about the drugs. I was enjoying myself, so the next day I refused to get in touch with the other guys, even though they left me a few messages. I remember back to shooting Dirty Work in Toronto in 1998 with Chris Farley, because Farley would pay whores to just sit around, smoke weed with him, and keep him company because he was lonely. That's where my head was at, before banging her once. <laughs> I was fascinated by the idea of paying a pretty woman to be my friend for the day. I was as far gone as Farley had been. I just wanted to spend an afternoon with a friend that wouldn't judge any awful thing I did. When it comes to hookers, the sex is secondary, in my opinion. The love you rent from them isn't real, but it's unconditional. And when you're using, struggling drug addict, love and a lack of judgment are exactly what you need. I never got a real name, but I did make make one up for her. This brought in my mind, I started calling her whore guide. Because, <laughs> because the moment we got outside, she started giving me the history of the city. She was incredible. I started enjoying her company so much that I dodged all the guy's calls and texts and took her on a cruise through the canals of the city. I was staying at the Dillon, which is a very posh hotel, and there were sightseeing boats parked outside in the canal waiting to take rich tours sightseeing by water. It was downright wholesome. Me, the guy driving the boat, and whore guide. Taking in Amsterdam's historical highlights together, we saw centuries-old townhouses, government buildings, famous residences, the Anne Frank House, and uh, all of this and more lay on either side in all of its splendor. Once again, I've got a hand at the whore guide. She was one informed whore. She knew more about the history of Amsterdam than the, bo the boat tour guide by a long shot. 
The only thing he taught me was where to get breakfast. That guy whom, uh, for the sake of argument, we're going to call Goebbels, <laughs> had a crisp Dutch accent and a high-strung voice. Basically, he sounded like a friendly Nazi, the way a counselor at a Hitler Youth summer camp might be. His Aryan nature became especially clear to me when he started talking about the Anne Frank house, explaining in great detail how long her family had hidden in the attic with the kind of re restrained glee that all Nazis have when discussing the suffering of Jews. Now that I think about it, he was more of a repentant Nazi. While highlighting the finer points of the house in Anne Frank's story as if he didn't want to reveal himself, it was all very rehearsed, and I felt like I was watching Yul Brenner do his 5,000th performance of The King and I. Once he finished talking about the Franks, though, he became his sinister, joyful self. Now, he said, his voice getting louder and his eyes getting wider, if you look just past the Anne Frank house, you'll see a great place for pancakes. <laughs> if I kid you not, he shouted the word pancakes as if he were saying Heil Hitler. Part of Crash <laughs> Well, as before you guys I, know... Before I read that, I realized my mother was here. <laughs> um, well, I think we're going to do some questions with Art. Uh, as you guys know, we, this is our second book we've written together. The first one was Too Fat to Fish. I don't know if anyone's read that. Um, and uh, has anyone read Crash and Burn yet? Anyone out there? All wow. right. Very nice. Yeah. Fast readers. We like that. <laughs> right? I appreciate it. Um, this is a very different project, as I'm sure those of you who have read it have already know. Um, Art, what was the, you know, when we started getting together again, it was a little bit different than last time. The other one was your entire life. This is a specific period of time. Right. Um, what was the easiest and hardest part about jumping in the, the writing boat again, which is probably different than the boat you were in in Amsterdam? Well, uh, the hardest part was, you know, realizing I had to write about the last five years. I mean, that's what the publisher wanted, and that was going to be very difficult because it was a very hard time in my life. Um, Too Fat to Fish had done so well that uh, I got an $800,000 advance for the next book, and the first, thank you very much, and uh, I'm just saying that for the broads here. Uh, <laughs> but I... Uh, I, I got 200 grand immediately. That was the first payment. So uh, after I got the 200,000, a couple weeks later, I crashed and burned, and I didn't do anything for a year and a half. And I got out of rehab a year and a half later, and my agent called me and said, Art, that's great uh, that you're feeling good, but if you don't write this book, you're gonna have to pay back the $200,000. So that was the easy part. I, <laughs> I said, I'm gonna write a book uh, about whatever you want. Um, so I, I, I had spent the 200,000. Uh, mostly on clothes. <laughs> <laughs> you went to the shows in Paris? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, so I was like, ah, it's money, and maybe it'll help somebody. You know, this book is so uh, hardcore and honest, I'm hoping that it helps someone decide not to do heroin. It's not a good move in life. Yeah. Um, what was, I mean, you know, obviously the hardest parts of the book... I think we could probably all guess what they were. Was there anything that, you know, even after getting sober and even talking through this stuff with me several times before we sort of committed it to paper, was there any part that you thought would be easy that wasn't? Uh, I, I don't think any of it would be easy. Uh, just because of, you know, uh, having to write about the morning that I, I tried to commit suicide was, you know, that's sort of like the, where the book takes a different turn. And uh, Too Fat to Fish really didn't have anything like that in it, that harrowing. And knowing that that was coming, it was like this, this, uh, this hurricane that you knew you had to walk through that uh, I was just procrastinating about. Uh, once I got through that part, the, the book became easier. But because that was in the middle of it, nothing about it was easy at all. Uh, and uh, it's even harder to reread uh, after it's done, you know. Yeah, I personally, I found that hard to even be your co-pilot on because it's so, I mean, let's face it, that's probably the hardest thing I hope I ever have to be a part of either. <laughs> yeah, um, a lot of I'm surprised when a lot of people say to me, uh, uh, did all that stuff really happen? Like, no, I'm making that up. <laughs> <laughs> we went fiction for the middle two chapters, so right, let right. it be known. It's a fairy tale. Yeah, <laughs> I thought that would sell books. Was there... <laughs> Was there uh, anything, I mean, was this at all a cathartic exercise once we were done? I mean, it took us a while, and there were some revisions, and 
uh, other delays and stuff like that. Was there, how, how do you feel now about having it out there? I, I think it's good. I've gotten a lot of responses from people who, who say it, uh, you know, they can relate to it. Um, uh, others that uh, can't believe it, but it's definitely something they're using as a cautionary tale. Uh, I don't know how it will be received, and I was uh, definitely worried about that. But, um, you know, you could tell when certainly people come up to you at stand-up gigs who you could tell have, have the same problems you've had and uh, say that they've read this stuff, and it makes them feel better. And uh, that alone makes it, makes it worth doing. That and uh, $800,000. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's one thing I have to say just about you know, co-writing and working with Artie is that Artie is the bravest uh, and the most objective yet subjective person I've ever worked with, if that makes any sense. He sort of has this amazing ability to um, like, look at his life as if it's not his life, yet also give you all the personal detail that I, as a co-writer, you know, crave, and it makes my job easier in a lot of ways, um, and makes the reading experience that much richer. Um, I just want to say that you're really brave to do it on this subject matter. Um, and especially something that we really worked on, too, is the end of the book, uh, you know, where somebody with addiction issues, there's never a fairy tale ending, and I really think that it's great that you went that way, you know, and um, it's still a struggle and all that stuff. Yeah, no, How's I mean, listen, I, I appreciate that, but I got to say, you're one brave guy, too. <laughs> At the same time we were writing this book, he was writing a book with Courtney Love. Just I came from her house. I don't know how the hell you didn't jump off a fucking building. <laughs> she, luckily, she lives in a smaller level <laughs> townhouse. <laughs> no, I mean, that is, uh, between me and her, that is, uh, you get some props for that, man. <laughs> Thank you. I just came from there, actually. <laughs> from Courtney Love? Yeah, I did. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, like the, I mean, with the ending and stuff, I think that was a great way to go. And how are you feeling about that? You know, at first we sort of almost went with more of a everything's okay ending. And then it was really all came from you. You really did a lot more reflection. And well, because, I applaud you, know, you for that. When I first tried to get sober, I was in my late 20s. And, you know, you think, uh, you know, you're Superman when you're in your 20s. And, uh, you realize that you're not. You start saying, okay, I'll, I'll never have a drink again. I beat this. I'm different than everybody. Now, at 46 years old, I realize that's a real pompous, stupid thing to say. Addiction is stronger than, uh, you know, any one person. And at any day, you could, uh, you could relapse and go back into that hell. Uh, that's why they say one day at a time. You know, um, it, uh, it's a real, uh, you know like I say, pompous thing to think that you're different than all these other people who have, been, who have died and, uh, and uh, went back uh, to drugs. And, and once you say that, you, you know, you're married to it and you're putting so much pressure on yourself. The ironic thing is, you know, uh, when you say I'll, I'll never use again, you probably will because that's so much pressure. Every day you're like, oh, God, I don't want to disappoint people. I don't want to disappoint people. And you end up thinking and worrying about the wrong things when you should just be worried about just getting through the day. Uh, so I wanted to make sure at the end uh, I, I didn't uh, let anybody think that, uh, you know, I'm for sure over this and beat it. That's not the case. you got to keep, you know, doing the right thing, I guess. And that's always been hard for me to, to do. Uh, so it's hard to admit you have to give up everything, too, because it could lead to worse shit. Like, I gamble, too, and I don't think I could gamble anymore. And people say, all right, you could have one beer, you can make one $5 bet. But with me, it leads to, to worse shit. Like, uh, it's like a domino effect. If I put down a $5 bet at a roulette table tonight at 10 o'clock, by tomorrow morning at noon, I'd be running guns to Cuba. <laughs> it just always gets bad. <laughs> yeah. Really fast. Yeah, too. really fast. <laughs> Before you know it, you're like, whoa, how did this happen? You know, I got a midget pregnant. Jesus. <laughs> And where's my passport? <laughs> and you have not, you don't know about a low point until you've waited in the waiting room of an abortion clinic with a midget. <laughs> <laughs> well. <laughs> That'll be book three. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, when are we getting going on, you know, back to the fun stuff, right? <laughs> um, uh over and over, I mean, do you think, you know, you, you are actually a great story of... By uh, the way, Mom, the midget thing is not true. <laughs> that <laughs> was a joke. Mom. <laughs> yeah. um, I was going to say, you know, over and over in showbiz, even this is in Two Fat to Fish as well, you 
always got another chance. Right. Uh, you know, whether it was Mad TV, the you know the way that you got that let go from that. Right. Thank there you. we go. Right. Mad TV crowd went that. out with a bang on that one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, between that, between uh, you know leaving Stern. And then getting your radio show on Sirius and DirecTV and all that stuff. Do you feel at points along your journey that the fact that you kept getting stuff given to you or that you kept getting up and finding your feet again, did that enable you in some weird way? And uh, how are you dealing with that now? I'd like to say no, but of course it did. I mean, show business is the one business where you get forgiven for awful behavior. And that in itself is an enabler. You know, right about in the book where Chris Rock was on... Uh, the Stern show one morning and Howard said, how do I help Artie? And, and, and Chris said, you're going to have to fire him. He's got to have consequences to what's, what he's doing. And, uh, you know, show business is the, 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 the kind of, you know, I mean, if I worked for IBM, I wouldn't have a job anymore. <laughs> they they would have gotten somebody else. But in, in show business, they're like, look, uh, you know, if, if, you, if you could still be funny, uh, if you could still be honest about all this and be funny about it, we'll take you back. We'll get you, give you another gig. Richard Pryor lit himself on fire, you know, and uh, he got an hour-long uh, movie uh, f about stand-up right afterwards, and he joked about lighting himself on fire. And it was brilliant, you know. Uh, and I always sort of modeled myself after uh, his career. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Minus the fire. Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, I, Crash and burn. You trying to tell us something? I would hope it'd be Jerry Seinfeld. I'd pick Richard Pryor. Um, but the way he always turned a tragedy in life into a brilliant comedy routine—that's what I loved. I couldn't believe he was able to do that. Um, that's a great bit in his first uh, concert film where he talks about shooting his wife's car while he was drunk, and he bought the car, you know? <laughs> and uh, he just makes something like that hilarious. While it's happening, it's a nightmare, but um, he was able to make it funny, and I, you know, I said, well, if I screw up, at least in this business, I could maybe, if I can make it funny, I'll, I'll keep working. And uh, I've had about four chances uh, back, and I don't know if I'll get another one, so we'll see what happens. But I've been very lucky, very lucky. I think if you worked at IBM, they might change Casual Fridays as their policy. <laughs> I'm just saying. Yeah. yeah. Um, should I ask more questions? Is it, uh, is it audience time? Or I'm happy to keep going. Keep yeah, going? Sure. Yeah. All right. Um, Giants chances of the playoffs? <laughs> just a quick one. Uh, just want to know. I, I'm glad I stopped gambling because of the Giants, I'll tell you. Uh, I don't know. You can't, figure, you can't figure the Giants out. You really can't. Uh, I, I love the Giants because Eli Manning, you know, uh, um, Tom Brady's life would be perfect if it wasn't for Eli Manning. You know, True. Something's <laughs> got to keep him in check. I mean, if you think about it, Tom Brady's married to Giselle Boonchin. He's got a $60 million house. He's got a, a bunch of money and rings. And, uh, but he can't uh, beat, uh, in the Super Bowl, he can't beat a guy who uh, looks retarded. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love Eli, but, you know, uh, he's a bit of a mouth breather. <laughs> oh, Lord. Right now, Eli Manning has his mouth open. <laughs> We're here at Apple, and he's somewhere. <laughs> but uh, he's a football player, and uh, I guess he just has to throw the ball. Uh, yeah, so I like the Giants, uh, and I, I don't know. They're, I don't think they're going to go 10 and 6, but they could win that division going 8 and 8, so you never know. Uh, I'm sure this isn't discussed a lot at the genius bar. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I had to do it. Uh, yeah, but, uh, you know, uh, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about Facebook later. <laughs> um, what is, how much is, uh, you know, the stuff from this period of your life going into your new stand-up stuff? I mean, I've heard a bit of your new routines. But yeah, I have a... Are you I ready have... to leave this behind? Are you exploring more? How do you feel uh, about it now? Well, I, I've been torn for the last couple of years with an hour and a half of material pretty much that's based on the last four years. It's the book in a more punchline-oriented uh, way. Uh, and I'm taping a special in April. And again, it's, it's telling stories about, um, about uh, being in, in rehab and being in a mental institution. There's one story I tell. I, I, I played Scrabble in a mental institution. And uh, you have not lived till you've done that. Uh, I was in a, a Scrabble game. There was three people in the game. It was me, and I was keeping score, which already makes it a shitty Scrabble game. Uh, the other person was a, an 80-pound woman who was a crystal meth addict. 
and I've said this before, crystal meth is a great drug if you need to walk to St. Louis one weekend. <laughs> <laughs> if that's on your to-do list, I would pick up some meth. Uh, and uh, the other guy in the, in the game was a 400-pound uh, guy who was on methadone and Thorazine, and he had not gotten his medication yet. So when it came, that guy's turn to go, he was third. There was an open G on the board. And he very calmly put an M and an R next to the G. And it said GMR. And I was scared to death of the guy. So I said, great word. Let's add that up. Uh, G is like a three. It's on a triple letter score. Great. The crystal meth woman goes, that's not a word. And under the table, I'm kicking her like, it's a fucking word. <laughs> She's like, that's not a word. I'm not accepting that. And I felt like going, really? Really? Now is the time in life when you're choosing to make a fucking stand. <laughs> now you get some dignity. You shouldn't have been 30 years ago when your prom date offered your blow in the backseat of a shitty limousine in Sea Caucus. Uh, <laughs> you know, now you're deciding to make a fucking stand in life. I felt like going, listen, we are in a psych ward playing Scrabble. It's over. Okay, we all went out in life and tried our little shit. It didn't work. I tried my comedy, nothing happened. You did whatever the fuck you did, it didn't happen. Hillbilly Jim tried his shit, nothing happened. Now we're here. So in the life we've created, GMR is a fucking word. Uh, has so anyone... that's, that's, that's the stand-up version of what's in the book. Has anyone mistaken you for Jimmy Kimmel lately? Yeah. <laughs> I was actually, yeah, I was in a, that really happened. I was in a psych ward and someone thought I was Jimmy Kimmel. And I explained to the guy three times I wasn't and he wouldn't take no for an answer. So I just said, yeah, I'm Jimmy Kimmel. And uh, I never told him I wasn't. So uh, I've apologized to Jimmy if he got any calls about that. Uh, but I don't think the guy called him. The guy uh, had a, carried around a copy of the Koran all night. He just would quote it. And one time he got me out of bed at 3 in the morning, and he brought me into his room, and he said, pray with me, Jimmy. And I said, okay. <laughs> so I put my hand on the book, and he went, no, sir, that boy, the Corinthians are going to back out of And uh, then he looked at me, and he said, I'll see you in heaven, Jimmy Kimmel. <laughs> and I left. Good times. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> All right, is it? Am I getting the signal? Okay. <laughs> Ready uh, well, for you, thanks, folks. Guys. Now it's uh, Q &A and A from Q and A, right? Hey, Artie, congratulations on the publication of the book. Thank you, Surviving. Man. Anthony, too, love your stuff. All the people that you've worked with. Two-part question for you, Artie, real quick. Would you consider yourself a sad clown? And now that you have this book out and all these great things are happening with you, what else do you want to achieve in life? Uh, a sad clown. I, I don't know. I guess some people might think that. I hate that term. <laughs> um, because, uh, you know, when I think of clown, I still think of, like, a, a guy with makeup on and a red nose. Um, and a beret. Yeah, and a beret. <laughs> uh, no, I'm not always sad. You know, I mean, I, I, I'm happy a lot of the times. Um, uh, you know, uh, a lot of times, uh, you know, after, uh, right after you get laid, you're happy for about 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then uh, life hits you back in the face again. Uh, I don't know. I um, I, no. So I, I I consider myself kind of a sad and happy comedian. Uh, uh, as far as what I'd like to achieve in life is just you know living, <laughs> just staying alive. I've I've been very lucky to have done a lot of things I dreamed about. Um, uh, you know, I don't know. I think. Uh, I'd like to swim with the dolphins or something. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I, I'm not a guy who's very outdoorsy, uh, so uh, I don't have a lot of those aspirations. I, I'd like to just lead a normal life. At 46, I'd like to just stop the craziness. I told Anthony I'd love to write a third book, but I am done doing research for these books. <laughs> the next one might be a lighthearted romp about me and a dog. Or Sounds good. I'm in. Let's <laughs> Maybe do I'll it. get a dog. A lot of people want me to get a dog. They think that'll help me. And uh, I would get a dog, probably, yeah. Nice. Hey, Artie, big fan. Hey, mm -hmm. man. Uh, now, this may be very difficult to speak about right now. Right. But being a Mets fan, I have two highlights in my life. The Bill Buckner ball. Right. And the Blue Iris bet. <laughs> <laughs> so could you give a little insight of 
Was that your low? Did you want to gamble after that, or was that like that was the last time the Mets I think beat the Yankees in you know record? But uh. yeah, uh, I, listen, as a Mets fan, I don't know what you go through on a day to day basis. I, really, I don't. Uh, that's a tough team to root for. Um, uh, Blue Iris again. She was a stern show character. Uh, you know, uh, yeah, she. Uh, I, I I made out with her once on the show. That uh, that has to be what it's like to be a Met fan. I'm sure she was an 85 year old porn star. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I mean, I just think uh, you know you guys are looking good this year. Um, I think uh, I think. Uh, Bernie Madoff might give you back some money to sign somebody. <laughs> I, that's my favorite story ever, that the Mets lost money to Bernie Madoff. That's the one thing that makes Bernie Madoff likable, <laughs> that he ripped off the Mets. <laughs> but uh, I don't know, the Yankees are starting to suck too, so uh, maybe it's time we all became Red Sox fans. I don't know. Just kidding. Hey, Audie, big fan. Hey, um, man. Question, do you think having a kid at this point in your life might change anything. You, I mean, I don't want to throw you under the bus if your girlfriend's here or not, but, you know, <laughs> just supporting the kid, being in and out, you know, just having a kid might wake you up a little bit or give well, you a whole different world. Well, you know, it, it hasn't for the last 10 years. I, if, uh, in, in Vegas, there is a half Filipino chubby kid who's 10 years old <laughs> who will not stop calling me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I, I keep trying to tell him his father's Kevin James. Uh, <laughs> now, you know, I think about kids. It really is. That's a hard question, man, because I can barely take care of myself. You need uh, a kids a lot of work, you know. Um, and uh, like one time my agent in L.A. as a gift when I was living there gave me a plant. And I put it on a terrace, and I completely forgot about it, you know. And I just hope I, I hope I would be more responsible with a child. But uh, some people are good at having kids, like the guy Warren Cromartie or, uh, on the Jets, or Antonio Cromartie on the Jets. He's got like 14 kids with 12 women, and he still can play football. I wouldn't. How do you? What's Christmas like for? Him? <laughs> that is insane. I, I, and he doesn't know all their names, you know. I'd love to have that kind of clear head. Uh, but uh, if I had one kid. Uh, uh, that might be enough. But people say you gotta have two kids because they have somebody to talk to. And I'm like, I don't know. I just gotta have it soon because I don't want to be in a wheelchair at the little league games. <laughs> uh, that's a hard question. We'll see. We'll see what happens. Hey, Artie, big fan. Hey. Um, I had a question for you. I've only been halfway through the book, so I apologize if this question is already answered in the book. No problem. But I was curious to know. After everything went down, did you want to go back to your old routine on Howard, or are you very content with not doing that anymore? Well, you know, it was eight and a half years, and it certainly ran its gamut, and I think what happened there was so crazy and so severe that um, people are just afraid something nuts might happen again, and I understand that, and I respect that, so uh, it was clear that it was time for me to move on in life and do something else, and the fact that DirecTV uh, gave me this opportunity to have my own show is pretty amazing. And uh, I'm very grateful for that. And I'm real happy doing it, you know. So uh, I think everybody felt it was time to, you know, the next chapter, whatever that was. And uh, it's, it's been a lot of fun and successful. So I'm, I'm happy with what's going on now. Yeah, thank you. Uh, hey, Art. Hey, man. You said you've been uh, mistaken for Jimmy Kimmel. Hey, weren't you also mistaken for Pam Oliver once? <laughs> yeah, I, I asked Bill. Well, I was at the Super Bowl, and I got a chance to ask Bill Belichick a question, and I told him I was Pam Oliver from CBS Sports. And uh, he looked like he wanted... Who was a, she's a black woman who does sideline reporting. And uh, uh, <laughs> he looked like he wanted to punch me in the face. But uh, there's, there's a defensive back for the Patriots. What the hell is his name? He's got a brother. Who's the guy? McCourty. McCourty. He was hilarious because uh, I did the same thing to him. And uh, there's all these reporters around. And I said, uh, Mr. McCourty, Pam Oliver, CBS Sports. And he looked at me and he went, man, you put on a couple. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, Pam, for that. Hi. Why Joe Buck to write the foreword? Uh, do, do you know what happened with me and Joe Buck? Yes, I Are saw the show. Oh, <laughs> Well, I, that, I thought it'd be kind of funny that everyone thinks we're like mortal enemies because of that. And uh, when the direct opposite is true, 
we've been very good friends, and he's been really good to me and nice about all that happening on his show. And I said, I thought it might be good. I was staying right in the middle of writing the book. I said, Anthony, wouldn't it be funny if we got Joe to do it? And I called him, and he immediately said yes. And, uh, you know, he thought it would be a good marketing thing, too. And uh, he wrote a great forward. It was really funny. And uh, it, it got me a chance to really apologize <laughs> publicly to him you know it was hbo and and uh, you know they knew i was gonna roast him a little bit i don't think they knew that the word cocksucker would be in the first joke <laughs> i think that took them aback a little uh so uh it got a chance for us to publicly make up i it was important to me that he'd be involved in the book and he did a great job with the forward so uh, that's why you know joe is actually funny yeah it he was, was funny. really really great yeah. really great he's a good guy all right. Well, Is that's that going to do it for tonight. Everybody join me in thanking Artie Lang for being here. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. It's as far gone as Farley had been. I just wanted to spend an afternoon with a friend who wouldn't judge any awful thing I did. When it comes to hookers, the sex is secondary, in my opinion. The love you rent from them isn't real, but it's unconditional. And when you're using struggling drug addict, love and a lack of judgment are exactly what you need. I never got a real name, but I did make make one up for her. This brought in my mind, I started calling her whore guide. Because, <laughs> because the moment we got outside, she started giving me the history of the city. She was incredible. I started enjoying her company so much that I dodged all the guys' calls and texts and took her on a cruise through the canals of the city. I was staying at the Dillon, which is a very posh hotel, and there were sightseeing boats parked outside in the canal waiting to take rich tours sightseeing by water. It was downright wholesome. Me, the guy driving the boat, and whore guide. Taking in Amsterdam's historical highlights together, we saw centuries-old townhouses, government buildings, famous residences, the Anne Frank House, and uh, all of this and more lay on either side in all of its splendor. Once again, I've got a hand at the whore guide. She was one informed whore. She knew more about the history of Amsterdam than the, bo the boat tour. A trip, this is from Crash and Burn. Things started out all right because I slept through most of the flight, but what really helped was that I was booked into a different hotel than the other guys. I had the cash to burn, so I'd booked a suite in a five-star establishment a couple of miles away from them. The first night I crashed hard because I still had a lot to sleep off, but by 4 p.m. the next day, I was rested and ready to begin my version of a well-earned vacation. Isolation and getting high. I had no problem celebrating Jason's upcoming nuptials my way because in my mind, that was still honoring him. So I got into a cab and told the driver to find me some fun. He took, me one, uh, he, he took one look at me and made a beeline for the red light district where I bought a bunch of pills from some guy on the street who was wearing a beret. I remember wondering if that was Amsterdam code for dealer holding. As a rule, berets piss me off on sight and I refused to talk to anybody wearing them. But this guy got a pass for life. He had, a, he had every opiate I'd ever heard of. So I bought a sack of pills, then went looking for a hooker, which is my chaser of choice for a double shot of opiates. I found myself a solid seven and negotiated a rate that would get her back to my hotel. This chick was a hooker through and guide by a long shot. The only thing he taught me was where to get breakfast. That guy whom, uh, for the sake of argument, we're gonna call Goebbels, <laughs> had a crisp Dutch accent and a high-strung voice. Basically, he sounded like a friendly Nazi, the way a counselor at a Hitler Youth summer camp might be. His Aryan nature became especially clear to me when he started talking about the Anne Frank house, explaining in great detail how long her family had hidden in the attic with the kind of re restrained glee that all Nazis have when discussing the suffering of Jews. Now that I think about it, he was more of a repentant Nazi. While highlighting the finer points of the house in Anne Frank's story as if he didn't want to reveal himself, it was all very rehearsed, and I felt like I was watching Yul Brenner do his 5,000th performance of The King and I. Once he finished talking about the Franks, though, he became his sinister, joyful self. Now, he said, his voice getting louder and his eyes getting wider, if you look just past the Anne Frank house, you'll see a great place for pancakes. <laughs> <laughs> If I kid you not, he shouted the word pancakes as if he were saying Heil Hitler. Part of Crash right. and Burn. <laughs> Anthony Boza and tonight's guest, author of the book Crash and Burn, available now on iBooks, Artie Lang. <laughs> What's up, guys? How you doing? Oh, I love you too, sweetie. Thank you. It's usually never a girl. It's usually a guy who yells that out. <laughs> 
That's all I have is cargo pants. Oh, thank, thank you for a, a woman yelling I love you instead of a plumber. <laughs> People said to me, uh, Art, did you uh, get laid a lot from being on the Howard Stern Show? And I said, if I was willing to have sex with guys who had their own bread route in Jersey City, I'd be like a young Warren Beatty. Uh, it's good to be here, and I'm glad you're here. I was getting drunk at the Genius Bar. That was <laughs> you know you're a drug addict when a Genius Bar is a trigger. Uh, this is Anthony Boza, my co-author. Hello. Very happy to be here. Very happy you're here. Uh, all right. Well, this is uh, a part of the book. Uh, <laughs> after I uh, got into a fight with my assistant on the Howard Stern Show on the air, I thought it'd be a good idea to go on a five-day bachelor party to Amsterdam. Uh, and uh, this is an excerpt from the book about that through, which is uh, really what you want when hiring a prostitute. Any guy who kids himself that a woman for hire is his girlfriend, even while it's happening, is a complete idiot. The fucking business is a fucking business, so act accordingly and everyone will go home happy. This broad was amazing. Just completely a prostitute. There was no way anyone at the hotel <laughs> Bellboy to the bartender to the desk clerk manning the graveyard shift was going to address her as Mrs. Lang. <laughs> and she was so accommodating, as high as I was at the time, I will never forget how understanding she was that I hadn't changed my American dollars into euros. She and I spent the rest of the night talking while crushing and snorting every flavor we could find in a bag of pills I'd scored. She spoke decent English, and we only had sex once, because like drug addicts will do, the time we spent together was all about the drugs. I was enjoying myself, so the next day I refused to get in touch with the other guys, even though they left me a few messages. I remember back to shooting Dirty Work in Toronto in 1998 with Chris Farley, because Farley would pay whores to just sit around, smoke weed with him, and keep him company because he was lonely. That's where my head was at, before banging her once. <laughs> I was fascinated by the idea of paying a pretty woman to be my friend for the day. I was 